Hello and welcome to this Deakin University alumni webinar with presenter Dr. Glenn Coston. Sam Johnston here from the Deakin Alumni Relations team. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which we're broadcasting today, the Wadwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, and to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today we're broadcasting from Deakin's Geelong Waterfront Campus and our webinar topic is Building a Better Future acknowledging the sustainability and energy efficiency divide in construction. To watch past webinar and seminar recordings, visit the webinar and resources page on the Deakin Alumni website. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Glenn Coston. He's a senior lecturer within Deakin University's School of Architecture and Built Environment. Prior to this, Glenn was at Riverina Institute of TAFE for 24 years delivering all levels of construction, trade, post-trade and pre-apprenticeship courses. Glenn is the author of a range of trade technical books and he is currently writing the major book for Certificate 4 in Building. He was also heavily involved in World Skills Australia as the Chief Judge and National and Regional Designer of Carpentry for a decade. Outside of education, Glenn designs heritage renovations, additions and new homes from a sustainability and energy efficiency perspective. Thank you so much for joining us today, Glenn. Over to you. Thank you, Sam. Okay, I won't welcome you all by name. It might take me a little while. Uh, this first slide that we've got up here, this is a little short story by Ursula K. Le Guin. It's, it's a fairly old one. It's been around from probably about the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. It's an interesting, one of those gracious little stories that talks of a society and what makes this particular society tick? And in this case, it's a beautiful society. Everybody lives wonderful lives, very full, very complex, quite intelligent, passionate lives. There's nothing simplistic about them. But each and every one of them has to go at some point and see what keeps their society going, what keeps it so beautiful. And in this case, it's a starving child in a locked cage or cell underneath the city. And they all know that if they were to set that child free, their city would collapse, their society would collapse. So they have to make a choice. Do they <clears throat> walk away or do they stay and live in the city and acknowledge that this is what's going on? Now, the premise of this whole talk is a little bit like that that underlying all of our drive towards energy efficiency, our thought about sustainability, there's some things underneath it that we don't necessarily look at as carefully as we should. So I thought what I'll do is just bring a few of these things to your attention. Not a lot, not everything, just a few. So let's start with why, why bother? Why are we going down this energy efficiency, sustainable housing path in the first place? What's the point? Well, the first one, of course, is quite logical. We're looking at it now and we've got, we've got a climate change issue in front of us. And yep, there's still some people out there who deny it and say it's not happening. But it doesn't really matter whether you believe humans are involved or not. The reality is the Earth is a finite uh, space. There's only so much air, there's only so much water. And anything we don't put into it is probably not a bad thing. So from that side, even if you don't necessarily believe in climate change, we do need to, can do something about it, possibly. So we know that we're into droughts and we know that we've got huge events that are starting to impact our lives. More bushfires in Victoria, for example, bigger ones. Um, I come from up in the northeast of Victoria, a place called Yakindanda, and we've had quite a few bushfires up there which get quite close and they're, uh, they look just as you're seeing that little picture on the screen. The other reason we want to try and do something about it is that we want to look at it as architects, as builders, as designers. We want to make sure that the decisions that we make are just decisions, decisions that are of benefit to, the, to more people than just ourselves. We want them so that the labours of, of many, as it turns out, 
are not wasted by poor decisions or simply lack of care by the few. And we're the few, believe it or not. So when we look at uh, climate change and energy efficiency and sustainability, when we start looking at these, particularly looking at uh, sustainable development, we look at three domains. It's fairly well known. Most of you have come across this before. We've got the environmental side of things. We've got the social side and the economic side. And if they overlap or where they overlap, that's where we think that we're going to get sustainability from. That's our aim. That's our drive. Unfortunately, that image you see on the right hand side there where people are sort of trying to keep their children out of the water, this is happening right across the Pacific. It's also happening in the Indian Ocean. You've got the Maldives, you've got the um, uh, Kiribati, these sort of places. They're slowly or actually rapidly disappearing under the waves. And our attention to the various elements within our buildings and our attention to the various things that we purchase to go into those buildings uh, is sometimes distracted and aimed perhaps inappropriately. So let's look at what we call sustainability and what we call sustainable development. Now, the one that you're most likely to be used to is the, Butler, the Brundtland Report from 1987. And that's effectively very similar to the set one down here you see at the bottom, sustainable development. That 1987 report puts it down as sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Very similar to what the, the Forum of the Future now has at the base of theirs. But the key word in their description of sustainability is dynamic, that it's a dynamic process. It's not fixed. We don't have a fixed target. We have to keep our eye moving, we, the target itself keeps moving and shifting. It's a very dynamic process that we have to work our way through. At the same time, we've got a new agenda out there. The UN's 2030 agenda, as they refer to it, there's 17 sustainable development goals tagged into that. And I won't go through all of them, but just a few of them, such as goal one, they're talking about end of poverty. Goal two, end of hunger. Goal three, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for, the, for <clears throat> all at all ages. And then they're talking about reducing inequality when they get down to 10 and ensure, and number 12, ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. We'll have a look at just how well we're achieving that with some of the choices that we make. Looking at this one here, these images, these are the Nightingale projects, and they're brilliant. They, they, I'm not going to sort of dish them at all. I'm, these, are, these are some of the best things that we're starting to produce now. Their focus covers all three of those domains, but the strongest areas of their, their focus Apart from, yes, they've got the energy efficiency, but the strongest one is actually in the social and the economic. Yet at the same time, we can still do better and there's still some challenges even facing these ones. The next two give you two 10-star homes, one from New Zealand, one from Australia. And again, excellent homes, excellent design, although I'm not overly keen on butterfly roofs and what we call box gutters. They're always got, something's going to leak there at some point, but that's just me as being a builder. But the reality is excellent designs and they are driving us forward exactly where we need to go, or so we think. But there's still underlying issues even with these. The op optimistic view of sustainability is that as we move ourselves forward, we will innovate, we'll design, we'll have new technologies that will constantly bring us forward and create a more sustainable world. 
That's the optimistic view. Unfortunately, the reality is something different. The reality is that we actually have all this pile of technology, which tends to not last quite as long as we'd like it to do, and we pile it up. We don't necessarily get rid of it the way that we should. We try to recycle, we aim to recycle, but it doesn't always play out the way that we want. Just recently, in, there's been a number of news reports where a lot of our materials are actually ending up in other people's backyards, ending up on some of the islands, ending up in other countries that are now rejecting these container loads of materials that are supposed to have one thing and have a, a, another. As we aim for energy efficiency, though, these are the main things that we try to achieve. And the reality is energy efficiency has to be in there. If we want a sustainable home or a sustainable building, we have to include energy efficiency. If we don't, we're not going to get there. And these are the key things that we look, always tend to look at. And again, you'll be used to most of these. Thermal mass, appropriate alignment on, with, with solar access, aligning the home, efficient glazing, orientation, size, thermal bridging, shading, all that sort of stuff. We're all good at that. Appropriate air flows, you can read them through for yourself. Efficient lighting, appliances, and appropriate insulation. All of these we go for, and power, solar power, capturing it, storing it, getting the infeed to work. Okay, that's, we need that. It has to happen. If we don't get that, we're not going to get into the sustainability. The problem for us, though, is that you don't have to be sustainable to be energy efficient. So if we look at the, some of these pictures here or some of these images, you can see up on the top right, up in here, we've got ourselves our concrete going into place, typical home, concrete slab, normal thing. If we're doing an energy efficient home, concrete slab, way to go. We all know that because it gives us our thermal mass. If we look in the middle picture, we've got ourselves insulation. And again, typically for most homes, they're still going with glass wool of some kind. And then down in our bottom left, we have ourselves our styrofoam, which is again, wonderful stuff. In fact, it's so wonderful that um, some of the builders think that it's better than anything else for one little trick that they told me about, and I'll let you into that trick later on. But none of those materials, and then we also have a look at our uh, LED light bulb over here, but none of those materials are necessarily sustainable. They've got question marks behind them, including our LED light bulb. In fact, the LED light bulb's got a big question mark behind it. So let's look at concrete. I'm not going to look at every single material. I'm just going to have a look at a few. I don't want to go through, well, I can't, don't, we don't have time. But what we'll do is we'll look at a few, and concrete's one. The first one, of course, is something that most of you will also know quite well. And that is that just to make cement, the pure, simple chemical reaction or molecular reaction that takes place to make cement out of limestone produces CO2. We can't actually do anything about that. We have to crack it. We end up with what we want and we end up with something that we don't necessarily want, the CO2. And yes, most of you should also be aware by now that five to eight percent of the world's CO2 comes from that making of cement. So that in itself is a big ticket item for us. Making cement, we make CO2, we don't need, we don't want CO2 in the atmosphere. That's what we're doing. And we do it time and again. We do it all, all around the planet. And we're increasing, not decreasing, the production of cement because we're increasing, not decreasing, the amount of concrete that we're producing. But the thing that a lot of people don't realise, because a lot of people think of concrete as being, OK, you mix up cement, you mix up some aggregates into it and you throw a bit of water and away it goes and what happens is it then dries out. Well, no, it doesn't dry out. The water 
actually locks in. It's another chemical reaction that takes place and your cement particles and your water particles bind together. They lock together. The water doesn't come back. You don't get the water back that you put in. So if you happen to need to throw in 200 litres of water to make your concrete mix, you've lost effectively, you'll gain a little bit of it back, but you've effectively lost 200 litres of water. When I say lost, it's not just withdrawn from the system, it's actually locked away. You won't get it back for the next 40, 50 years. That's assuming that at the end of 50 years, you actually smash up that concrete and dry it out, which is another point. You'll find a lot of websites out there saying about how wonderful concrete is because it'll last forever. And they'll point to concrete from Rome or whatever else, and they will say, yeah, that's fantastic stuff because it lasts forever, thousands and thousands of years. No, the reality is the Portland cement type of concrete that we have today gives you roughly 100 years at best, but often bridges and things are being dismantled or being um, brought down at around about 50 years. So all those big high-rise buildings that you see out there and going up at some point in the cities, at some point they have to come back down again. And 100 years probably about pulls them up. So that water is lost. And the image I'm showing you here is Port Phillip Bay. And most of all, well, many people here that are listening are ringed around Port Phillip Bay. And you can look at that bay. The bay holds about approximately 25 cubic kilometres of water, salt water admittedly, but water. Concrete annually across the planet takes out around about four fifths of that up to around about 20 cubic kilometres of water. So four fifths, four fifths of Port Phillip Bay is locked away in concrete every year. So by the time we reach around about 2030, as the increases go, we're talking, you know, possibly as much as uh, three, 400 cubic kilometres of water being locked away. And unfortunately, that's the potable water. That's the drinking water stuff that we need. The other crazy thing, of course, is that it's coming out of mostly out of areas where the water is actually very scarce. So places like the Middle East, um, some parts of Central America, South America, these areas can be quite dry. And that's where the water is actually being taken from. So <clears throat> we have quite an issue there. On top of that, the water withdraws from the system around about 70 cubic kilometres of water annually. So that is our biggest problem with concrete. Not so much the CO2, that's one, but this little hidden one, the water. So looking at that early concrete, the concrete from Rome, so what is that if that's not just concrete that we play with? That concrete actually was made with salt water. And salt water actually strengthens Roman concrete, particularly the stuff in the, you'll see, uh, again, you can go online, you can have a look at some of these images, the sea walls that used to protect a lot of the Roman infrastructure. These were built using not Portland cement, as we know, they were using volcanic ash. And using volcanic ash, mixing it with salt water aggregates the end result there is a incredibly superior concrete in terms of durability not in terms of strength it's not actually quite as strong as the concrete that we can produce today but in terms of durability and so their buildings and their structures have been around for yes three thousand years four thousand years a extended period of time compared to what we can possibly achieve our concrete won't be there for that period of time the Egyptians had similar things and they used uh, Nile River, River silt or some of the elements from the Nile River silt. <clears throat> so that was our concrete. So our concrete's not so great, but we use it as our thermal mass. It's the big ticket item for most of our energy efficient homes. So let's have a look at the LED. Now on your right here, you'll see there's a like a spider web and this is a typical uh, what they call an L, 
LCA, Life Cycle Assessment Web. And you can see in the outer ring, that blue line, that's your incandescent bulb, supposedly. And then inside you've got your fluoro bulbs, your mini fluorobes or compact fluoro bulbs. And then inside that you've got the LED as it was back in 2012. And then inside that you've got the purple line, which is the LED where they think it's going to be in, or thought it was going to be in 2017. The reality is it hasn't got there. It hasn't, it's closer to being out, out around where the uh, green line is. The problem with doing a <clears throat> life cycle analysis or an LCA, particularly on in, uh, equipment or items like this, an LED, is that there can be a 60% variation between studying one bulb and studying another bulb, similar bulbs, but they different manufacturers, uh, slight different change in the shape, whatever else, you can end up with a 60% 60, 60 variation. The other problem is it's actually highly variable in terms of the data that's available to you. So when you do an assessment, you're often having to rely on the data that's coming from the manufacturer. And it's not that the manufacturer necessarily is trying to hide something, it's just that the manufacturer may not necessarily have the data themselves. So they are often challenged to provide the real world data as to where all this uh, energy and so forth is going, where the carbon footprint really is. But then you get, if you look carefully at this web that's here on the right, if we look up onto this area up in here on the top, whoops, go back one. Up on this top left hand side here, it's got radioactive waste landfill. And supposedly the incandescent is sitting out there because they, this is just how they do them. They create a circle, a circle, a circular pattern and then the arm that reaches out there is sort of technically 100% and the idea is that the next arm inside or the next uh, mapping inside is a percentage of that arm. So supposedly radioactive waste landfill for an incandescent sits right out there and supposedly a fluoro or an LED sits back in here. Well, the reality is there is no radioactive landfill from an incandescent light bulb at all. So if we come down into some of these other areas, same deal applies. You've got very questionable arms here to be looked at as we go through. So. LCAs, as we know them, aren't really quite as good as they should be. But here's another problem. The bulk of that arm, or these arms, and the efficiency, the energy efficiency of the LED, is based on the actual amount of energy that an LED consumes whilst, and the incandescent consumes, over its lifetime. So if we look at an LED in terms of how much energy is consumed in making the LED, you quickly find that the materials and so forth in them consume an enormous amount of energy and there's an enormous amount of materials and particularly rare earth metals involved. All the components and so forth from an LED compared to an incandescent massive number of components and, as I said, frequently rare earth metals. If we look at this image here, the graph, you can see the LED on the right and you can see the red line representing the amount of metals involved, the green line in representing the electronics, the plastics and then the glass. In the incandescent, the only one that has, the only element that has more is in the glass. But the amount of energy consumed by the incandescent light bulb over time, and we'll go back a couple of slides. If we run that over time, then the incandescent is going to be massively more consumptive of energy. We know that. The incandescent will use significantly more. 
the LED is basing this energy consumption win on life cycles of up to 50,000 hours. That's the claim. The problem is, what happens if an LED doesn't last 50,000 hours? What if it doesn't last 15,000 hours? What if it doesn't last 1,000 hours? Now, the problem is, again, I come from out of northeast Victoria. What I do know about rural power supplies in Victoria and most other states is that they are dirty power supplies. That is to say that they tend to brown out quite frequently. Electronics don't like brownouts. So what actually happens is that I know for, from my own experience, and many of you have probably had similar experiences, that the LED light bulb, you put it in and you're looking for that 50,000 hours, the years of use that that bulb is going to give you. And the thing blows up two weeks down the track. I've had them blow up within hours of putting them in. They're getting better and they are starting to last towards the, the year length, but that's nowhere near the thousand hours that we're sort of needing to beat. And the problem is, is the moment they don't reach a thousand hours, the incandescent bulb actually is the better product. But yes, I can also understand where the government needs to sit with this, despite the bulbs continuing to blow, despite them not lasting necessarily greater than a thousand hours. If they don't, if, if they allow us to keep using incandescence as we were, that means they've got to put more infrastructure in place and we have to burn more coal. So even though we're not getting what we're supposed to be getting with the LED, we're still going to have to consume more energy. But what we're missing is where that energy is being consumed and the consumption of the energy is actually taking place not here, not in our backyard. So we don't see it and we don't notice it. And we don't notice particularly the rare earth elements and all those other components that go into it. And what we're not seeing there when we don't see that part is we don't see this picture. Most of our rare earth elements, much of our, not so much rare earth elements such as cobalt's not really in a rare earth element, it's, it's, it's rare in that it's in, found to be in certain places. It's not really widely distributed, but it's not technically a rare earth element. But those minerals that go in to make up our LED come out of these sort of mines artisanal mining or small scale mining, ACM mining, ASM mining. They're the ones that actually do the dirty work, that get in there with their children, whole families, digging in holes, no support, collapses, short, short life expectancy, all of that so that we can have the materials that we want to make our homes more energy efficient. They're the things that we're just not looking at. And as we drive towards energy efficiency and drive towards the use of these sort of materials to make our components more energy efficient, the number of artisanal miners increases. And you can see that in the chart here on the left hand side, how rapidly it has moved from 1993 to 2017. And if you look at that figure, and that figure is actually a little bit undercooked, as they say. They're now talking around about possibly 100 million small scale miners out there compared to if we look at the number of miners that are actually operating um, in the normal industry, only 7 million, a massive difference. So then we look at our insulation. And we'll just look at polystyrene for the moment. That little bunch of formulas and models, if you like, of molecular structures, all the various names, all tell you that not good. It's not the greatest material on the planet, but most of you should know that. A lot of it, a lot of the materials that are in it 
are what we call bioaccumulative toxins. That is to say that if we, they get into us or they get into uh, other animals, then the end result is that they will accumulate inside you and they can actually sensitise you so that you get a small amount and the next time round, what actually affects, how it actually affects you is significantly more. It's a brilliant material in terms of insulation. The only problem with it is that once you've got it, once you've got polystyrene, you tend to have it. You've made it and getting rid of it is kind of tricky. You can uh, recycle, but we tend to recycle by crushing, that's the usual one, uh, and then just reusing it in a different way. So it's not quite recycling it. We can use other processes, but they are very energy consumptive to do it. And again, more toxic materials have to be used to actually make it work. It doesn't biodegrade, it's, it's listed as not being biodegradable or, at all. So we whack it into the landfill, but it, we come back in a thousand years time and it will still be there in the same form that it is now. Builders out in central New South Wales once told me how wonderful this material was when I was looking at it and saying I was not too keen on it. And they said, but it's brilliant. And I said, well, yeah, but what do you do with all the waste? And they said, the waste. And I said, yeah, the stuff that, you know, when you've cut it away, what do you do with it? And they said, well, it's brilliant. You just lay it on the ground. And I said, yeah, laying on the ground, what's it going to do? And they said, and then you pour petrol on it. And I was horrified. I said, what, and then you stick a match to it? And they said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. You just pour petrol on it and it dissolves and then disappears into the ground. It's brilliant stuff. So not necessarily well understood as a material by some builders and not something that you really want to do that particular trick to because of course then it goes straight into our groundwater which is another issue again. If we look at the amount of energy that's involved, if we look at that little chart down the bottom right hand side, you can see the amount of embodied energy in the materials as well and just gives you a range here, mineral wool, cellulose and then you've got your actual expanded polystyrene and again if you look at it in that light it's very very energy inefficient and not a sustainable product at least at all and then we'll have a look at the solar power now we're all going down the solar power route and in fact Again, some of you may have heard of the town of Yakandanda, and there's a thing called Tri Yakandanda, totally re renewable yak. And if you ever drive to Yakandanda, you'll see homes with this little yellow yak, as in a, the, the animal, the yak, um, a little cutout of one of those sitting on a, a wall or a gate or something like that, sometimes you know, pinned over a door. And that's indicative of that particular house being part of a program where the whole of the town is trying to become completely energy self-sufficient, okay? And it is a fantastic program. And yes, out in those sort of areas, I think a necessary one. The downside is that to achieve it, one, you've got to have solar panels and the solar panels aren't necessarily lasting as well as they should. There's issues there that are popping up, not necessarily in Yak, but in others, other areas where the panels are not lasting the 20 years. They're lasting maybe two or three before they get leaks in them and then fail. But the bigger issue is if they move to, and they're going to have to, or we're going to have to, move to battery backup systems, then you start to have problems because then we have to start looking at what type of battery and the usual battery, the one that works for most, that gives you the storage that you're after and we're using them in our cars now and that's our big drive towards get to, excuse the pun, uh, to get to an energy efficient society, take away the petroleum and run our cars on electricity. But the houses are doing the same thing. We look at lithium and lithium is the big one followed by cobalt, another big one. And again, you can see these images. This is how those materials are sourced. 
the cobalt dug out of the ground by whole families trying to work their way through. And what we're doing is actually shifting economies. We're actually changing the economy of a country so that if there's drought or whatever else that happens to be occurring in that land, then yeah, we can argue and we can say, well, we're giving them something to do. We're giving them some work. We've got, they can go and earn money by digging holes in the ground and getting the cobalt for us so that we can live the lifestyle that we want so that we can feel that we're being sustainable. It's not necessarily the picture that you'd want beside your nice cardboard cutout or of a, of a yak. Um, but that's the image that's behind it. That's what's actually going on. In terms of lithium, we're pulling it out of the Atacama Desert. Now, many years ago, I hiked all around that region and was walking through and the Atacama or Sala at Atacama, the Sala de Atacama, the large uh, lake there. At that time, it was fairly pristine. Now, we've got huge issues as they try and mine the uh, brine from which the lithium comes from. The mining companies are fighting each other. There was a big dispute just been happening just late last year and continuing this year between the two of them as to who is mining more than they should. One blames the other. And yet at the same time, the governments have given them the go ahead to mine more. Every time we mine lithium, as we go for it, we're actually having to use copious amounts of water to actually cleanse the brine and get it to the point where we want it, where we can get the lithium extracted. Out of that lake, every year, we're pulling about 80,000 metric tonnes of lithium out of the brine. To do that, for every tonne of lithium, we need 1.9 million litres of water fresh water, potable water. So that means that the farmers that live in those areas, and there's, it's the driest desert in, 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 on the planet. And so you think, well, who's farming? Well, the reality is there are actually some small little uh, valleys ringing around there that have farming communities. And with those, we have an issue where they have to truck in water just to survive. At the same time, we're also pulling out rare earth metals and so forth um, to get into those batteries. And the problem is, when we go to recycle any of these things, including the LEDs, the only there's only one company in Australia at the moment that is actually gearing up to dismantle the LEDs and dismantle these sort of electronic batteries and you name it. With an LED, at the moment, they're about to get a new machine in place. It'll be able to pull down and extract half a millimetre strand of gold wire, which is not bad. But then I asked and said, so how much are the rare earth metals? Those ones that are being mined by those families that you just see in front of you right here. How much of those rare earth metals do we get back? And they said, none. All of the rare earth metals are lost to the system. They can't get any of it because it's too fine. So their labours have to keep going because we keep needing the rare earth metal. They dig it out and effectively we throw it away. So with all this, is there any sort of grand conclusions or am I sort of saying that, you know, I have the great, some solutions to you? No, but there are some solutions out there. If you can start making some slightly more informed decisions, look more carefully behind the products, you might find that there are some products that we can start looking at. There's new styles or new thoughts about incandescent bulbs. And those new ones, again, using very, very simple materials, abundant materials, cheap materials, um, easily recyclable materials, that's the, the key factor to it. Um, those ones can actually be found anywhere. Um, and these new, new incandescent light bulbs 
haven't hit the market yet. They haven't even gone into manufacture yet, but there are potential, there are possibility. The question mark is, is whether we will actually strive hard enough to want them. We've got CLT, cross laminated timber. There's a new factory being built just right out here at Avalon Airport. So out or out near the airport. That is a great material and it's been used to great effect at uh, 25 King Street in Brisbane to build that one of the largest uh, high rise all timber buildings in the world. How, how much uh, energy is used in the manufacture of those, that's still to be debated, but it's still a more efficient material than concrete. And then you have some of the phase change materials that are uh, out there for us, where we can actually use potentially, again, uh, 15 millimetres of gyprock will give you the equivalent of about 140 millimetres of concrete in terms of thermal mass. So we have some materials there that we can start looking at for or at and for to use in our uh, buildings and structures that will actually improve our sustainability as well as still get that energy efficiency that we're seeking. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your time. That's great. Thank you so much, Glenn, for that. It's given us a lot to think about, I'm sure. Um, we have time for some questions now. Um, so if anyone who's been sitting on some questions, please type them into your questions box and hit submit, and um, we'll get to as many as we can in the time we've got. We had a few come through during the presentation, uh, both from Jeff. Firstly, Jeff asked, did Roman concrete contain reinforcing steel? Uh, no, it didn't. Okay. Uh, no, they used uh, large pieces of stone and uh, it bonded to those large pieces of stone. Um, there is also a, a suggestion, or the suggestion, evidence that uh, not all of the stones in the pyramids were cast stone out of concrete, but there are some of the stones were cast concrete not all, um, and there's been significant study on that as well, but no steel, I didn't use steel. Right. And Jeff also asks, true or false, Australia being the second largest natural reserves of lithium globally, do you know, is that is that true or uh, I read, as I was do doing this, I was reading some evidence along those lines, but I don't think it's quite true. Uh, we are regarded as one of the major centres or sources for potential sources for rare earth elements. Um, uh, and there will be lithium in some of our salt lakes, particularly uh, uh, Lake Eyre, for example. But whether that matches uh, what's coming out of South America, I don't believe so. Right. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Mr. Hossen asking, how do you think we can mitigate bushfire? Uh, mitigating actual the, the bushfire itself. Mm -hmm. um, harsh reality, I don't think we can. We can we can adapt to it. We can live with it. Um, I'm at the moment uh, looking at some uh, research that I wish to start in uh, probably about three months, four months time, which is more about sustainable buildings, bushfire sustainable buildings, and what makes one sustainable versus one that's not. Um, sorry, not sustainable, survivable. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the bushfire itself, no we could go through, we could try and do some of the things that we've been doing in the past, which is back, you know, burning off as we go, sort of, and the CFA and the like have been doing this for, for many years. We could probably improve those strategies to a certain degree, but the reality is bushfire and the types of heat waves that we've got going now, um, we're going to have to adapt to it. Um, and uh, Zainab has asked if you could expand a little more on the phase change materials that you mentioned, so chip rock to concrete. Okay. Um, 
there's <clears throat> the phase change materials, the ones that they there's a, about three different forms out there at the moment. Two are very similar. Uh, two come from uh, effectively the one company, Bassif. Uh, they are paraffin wax encapsulated in uh, in nano, or not quite nano size, but microscopic size um, uh, acrylic balls. So there's, they're obviously extremely small. Um, these acrylic balls, they actually hold this paraffin wax inside, so it encapsulates them, it can't be lost, it can't leak out. Um, and what happens is that as the energy is uh, absorbed by the, the balls, the, the paraffin wax within the balls, then becomes fluid or becomes liquid. And then what happens is as it uh, hardens or becomes uh, solid again, it's releasing the energy and putting it back out into the into the space and the area that you've got. Now, there are some products out there at the moment. Um, there's one called uh, Smartboard. Uh, I don't believe it's available here in Australia, but if you, it's by Kauf, I think it is K-A-U-F. Um, they... Uh, you can contact them and ask, you know, when its availability will, will be here, or if it's if they've got it here yet. Uh, their website's not showing it. Um, so that's a. It's just like a plasterboard, but these little micro capsules are inside the plaster and littered through it. Um, Charles Sturt University uh, up at Aubrey at Laguna. Uh, they've already used that same sort of material many many years ago. Uh, decades ago actually, uh, and incorporated it into um, their concrete flooring slabs. And that's helped the energy efficiency of, of their uh, university buildings. And there's another one, which actually is, I consider probably the best of the lot at the moment, um, for retrofitting. And that is, it's more of a gel. So, and they don't use paraffin wax at all. They actually use uh, leftover um, material from uh, soybean manuf uh, milking and manufacture and so forth. And the, that material is combined with a few others to actually make a gel, which is then actually put into sheets. And you can put these sheets underneath timber floorboards and actually produce a thermal mass that beats a concrete slab on the ground. So again, decent materials. Um, if you want to go read more about that, you can go out to a site, I think it's called, um, if you type into the internet, the state of phase change materials in Australia, type that into uh, Google for you and see what you find. And I think you'll find that there's a, a very good article there which should explain a fair bit of that. And just quickly, for anyone not familiar with the Nightingale developments you mentioned, could you talk a little bit more about some of the the initiatives they're using in their work that that you see as innovative and that um, that address some of these sustainability issues? Um, the main thing with with, sustain, with, with uh, Nightingale, it's not so much the the buildings. The buildings are one thing. I mean, the buildings are terrific. Um, and uh, they're taking you know, basically mainstream concepts, uh, things that have been out there for quite a while uh, in designing the buildings. Um, but what I think is the big thing is the way that they actually fund the projects. So you get like-minded people, people who are actually already on board with this sort of uh, a desire to make a sustainable lifestyle, the desire to make, be part of a sustainable building. Those people are, are captured straight away, so to speak, and they put the money in. There's no developer involved. The, the architects and the clients, if you like, are the developers. They're the people who actually do it. So there's no developer's fees for a start. There's also a tax break by doing that, um, and I'm not an economist, so I don't get, I'm not going to get too far into that one. But there's uh, 
they're the key benefits in that regard. They also do some interesting things in terms of the choices that the people, the clients who are actually going to live in them, they get some choices about how they want the thing to look. So again, there's this adaptability that they're trying to build in um, into the facades, for example. Um, the, uh, but in terms of the energy efficiency and so forth, uh, I think you, you'll find that if you look at it, they're fairly, fairly mainstream in, you know, looking at where they get solar access appropriately from, uh, the way they design the building is, they're, they're, that's innovative too because of the way they, um, it's a communal building in many ways. Uh, you've still got your independence and, but they can make it so that, you don't have big car parking spaces, wasted car parking spaces. You don't have massive, uh, everybody having their, a laundry or something. They can have uh, communal laundries, this sort of thing. Um, so they're, they're, it's a different type of, it's a, it's a lifestyle you enter when you enter one of these buildings and or you join in with one of these buildings. It's not a, uh, it's not just a building. And at the same time, you're, you're, when you contract in, uh, you're not going to make a huge profit. It's, it's actually benchmarked, so uh, you can only get so much profit on the return of selling it to somebody else. You can't go, okay, now Nightingale projects are fantastic and everybody wants to be in one, so therefore I can sell it to the highest bidder. That, that's not how it works. So again, it, it keeps affordability in there, and it's that affordability part, that, that social equity, that uh, the economic strain or... or um, uh, domain that we're actually, or well, they're actually looking at, and, and so it's it's that type of thing. Hmm. And carrying on for that from that affordability discussion, Miranda asks, do you see tiny houses playing a role in sustainable housing solutions in the future? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my own house isn't tiny, but it's uh, it's thirteen and a half squares of house, which you know, it's not, not it certainly doesn't go under the tiny heading. But with uh, two teenagers and two adults, it's pretty small. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there, there's a certain there's a particular relevance for uh, tiny houses. Um, it's where you where we can put them at times. That's that's a, a bonus. Uh, that they can be moved often is a, is another big bonus. Um, the question mark that has to be around the tiny house though is if it's um, if it's a one person abode then perfect perhaps uh, but maybe at the same time it maybe the nightingale approach actually beats the tiny house in a way um, in, in certain aspects because there's this shared element to it and so where a tiny house has to have four walls, let's make it really tiny, make a little four wall box. Um, the tiny house, house has to have four walls for one person. Whereas uh, if you have multiple dwellings within the one, then obviously you're sharing walls, for example. Um, but uh, again, how we make a tiny house, uh, the materials involved in them, they tend to allow for lightweight materials and if we start looking at these uh, PCMs, these phase change materials incorporated as well, we can have quite a significant thermal mass in quite a tiny structure and lightweight structures. So I think they, have a, they, they will definitely have a role. Mm, great. <clears throat> right, well, thank you very much, Quinn, again, for your um, time in answering these questions and for the presentation. It was fantastic. Good. Thank you. Um, I've got a few more slides to get through just as we finish up. And um, just a reminder for everyone listening in that we have a presence on Facebook and LinkedIn as Deacon alumni, and we'd love to have you follow us and stay involved with the conversation. So just do a search and um, join up with us, that would be great. We offer a 15% uh, discount for Deacon alumni and their immediate family for postgraduate course fees. I don't, if you don't know about that, please go onto the website and find more information, or you can email deaconalumni at deacon.edu.au. Fantastic uh, offer there. 
And also we run a whole bunch of competitions throughout the year for our alumni. And you can find out more about that in the Deakin Times monthly newsletter or on social media. There's some great prizes available. So please do um, stay in contact with us and take advantage of those. And while on the subject of staying connected, uh, we really want to make sure that we have your contact information so we can get in touch with you about uh, webinars such as this or events um, in your area. So if we have your home address, we can also invite you to events close by to where you're living. So you can email deaconalumni at deacon.edu.au to update your information or head to engage.deacon.edu.au 